the best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Tonight at 8, a father stabbed in the face while trying to protect his wife and baby during a home invasion. What we are learning about the suspect's criminal past. Calls growing louder to shut down a Georgia detention center accused of performing unwanted hysterectomies on immigrant women. But first tonight, breaking news. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died. She was 87, the oldest member of the U.S. Supreme Court. We are told that she died at her Washington, D.C. home of complications from pancreatic cancer. Again, she was 87 years of age. It was her fifth bout with cancer. The longtime justice appointed to the bench by President Bill Clinton in 1993. She was a great advocate for progressive politics and for the equality of women, a, a feminist who made sure that women were able to shatter the glass ceiling. We'll have a lot more on her life and the impact of what she represented in the United States sitting on the high court. All of that coming up later in this broadcast. For the first time, we are hearing directly from the man punched by Clayton County deputies during a traffic stop. Roderick Walker took a beating and he was just released from jail last night. Today, our first opportunity to ask him about the events that transpired last week. Joe Hankey caught up with him as Walker's attorneys raised new concerns about the deputies. An emotional Roderick Walker during a press conference today, one week after cell phone images show Clayton County Sheriff's deputies pinning under the ground while punching him. I was scared. And I feel for my life. Just pray. Just hope that it don't happen to nobody else. On Thursday, the Clayton County Sheriff's Office identified the deputies holding down Walker as Brandon Myers and Dakota Riddick. Walker was arrested for battery and obstructing officers. Video of the arrest went viral, and then Deputy Myers, who was hired last November and still was on probationary status with the Sheriff's Office, was fired for excessive force. The Clayton County District Attorney is now investigating. Walker's attorney, Sean Williams, is calling for Deputy Riddick to also be fired. In his own report, acknowledges amidst, amidst the beating Mr. Walker in the head should have also been terminated. 
Williams also called into question other cases involving Deputy Myers. We've learned Mr. Myers had prior incidents similar to Mr. Walker's. Williams provided five reports today of Myers using various forms of force to arrest people since joining the force in November. 11 Alive has not independently received the reports from Clayton County, but none of the reports detail injuries to deputies or citizens. In all five incidents, Sheriff's Office supervisors found Myers followed department policy. The incident report for Walker's arrest details Riddick stopping a vehicle for a broken taillight and a front seat passenger not wearing a seatbelt. Walker, the passenger, was asked for ID. The report claims Walker refused to identify himself. And when Riddick attempted to detain Walker, he ran and fought Riddick and Myers. Williams refutes Walker not wearing a seatbelt or being an aggressor. He was being beaten in his head. He was tased, continuously beaten over and over again. They used an illegal, in my view, choke hold on him that almost killed him. Walker's attorneys say he lost consciousness twice and since bonding out of jail, doctors have diagnosed him with a mild traumatic brain injury, cognitive problems, headaches, dizziness, a left eye injury, nerve damage to his arm, as well as jaw and knee injuries. A Brookhaven couple attacked by an intruder inside their home tonight. We have learned the suspect is in jail. He had just been released from prison 45 days ago for a similar attack. 11 Alive's Latasha Givens on the story for us all new tonight. Get on the ground. This body camera footage shows Brookhaven police arresting Jimmy Mills after officers say he stabbed a man and attacked a woman inside their home on North Druitt Hills Road Thursday afternoon. Police say the wife was in the shower when Mills confronted her. I came into the home and pulled back the shower curtain, uh, at, which of course caused her to scream. Uh, in response to her scream, her husband came from another room. Lieutenant Davis Snively says Mills stabbed the husband in the face and stomach several times. Both of them are, are traumatized by this incident. It's really, truly the, the thing that nightmares are made of. Police say Mills ran off and home surveillance video shows him allegedly trying to break into another home before he was arrested on Village Point. Police records show Mills broke into another Brookhaven home back in 2015 and attacked two women. They fought back and Mills ran off, according to police. But in 2016, Mr. Mills pled guilty. Uh, he was sentenced to 8 to 15 years in custody. Uh, but here in 2020, just four years later, uh, he was released. Uh, and about 45 days after his release, uh, he's committing another identical violent offense. The department says it's concerned Mills was granted parole so soon. Every branch of the criminal justice system has a role to play uh, in making sure that offenders are rehabilitated and held accountable. Is that a violent repeat offender uh, was released in, in such form that he continued to prey on other members of our community. Under Georgia law, most inmates are eligible for parole after serving a third of their sentence, with exceptions for more violent crimes and repeat offenders. In Mill's case, the parole board says he served more than half of his sentence before he was paroled in August. There's now a warrant hold for him so he cannot be released on bond. Let's take a look at some of the other top headlines tonight. We now know the name of a woman killed when a tree fell on her as she was walking her dog in Snellville. Yesterday, unincorporated Snellville, Gwinnett County Fire is now saying that 71-year-old Lynn Alice Trapp was pinned under the tree on Capot Court. She was one of two people who died in Metro Atlanta as the remnants of Hurricane Sally toppled trees and caused all kinds of problems in many neighborhoods in North Georgia. A fire at the Gwinnett County apartment complex that we are showing you right here, leaving some Without a home tonight, Gwinnett fire crews are now saying that four top floor apartment units were destroyed after a blaze ripped through the Bella Apartments in Norcross, causing heavy damage. It took crews more than two hours to put the fire out. No word on any injuries. Apartment management and the American Red Cross are helping those who lost their home. Starting this Sunday, the Commerce Department plans to restrict access to TikTok, at first, you still will be able to use it, but there won't be any new downloads. The bigger issue will be in November when the ban on crucial services like internet hosting will take effect. The crackdown comes amid allegations the app is collecting huge amounts of data from users and its connection to China's military and intelligence services. A reversal from the CDC today on coronavirus testing for asymptomatic people. The very latest guidance suggests anyone who has been in close contact with an infected person for at least 15 minutes should be tested, even if they are not showing any symptoms. Less than a month ago, 
the CDC advised those who had been exposed to the virus but didn't have symptoms did not necessarily need a test. The agency now also recommends people self-isolate while waiting for their test results, and they should stay home for 14 days, even if the results are negative. Taking a look now at some coronavirus headlines today, the CDC is now reversing its controversial guidance on, on asymptomatic people, as we told you all about that. Now, uh, again, we told you that these are issues that people need to be tested for. Also, Georgia reported 63 additional COVID deaths today, sending our numbers back up after being down for several days. The past two days have been significantly higher than our current average of 43 deaths. We spotted a trend in the data today. While the numbers are still very small, there has been a steady increase in COVID deaths among 18 to 29 year olds. The group has seen most number of cases with more than 76,000. But July 1st to today, the number of deaths has grown from 14 to 51 faster than any other time during the pandemic. CBS is adding 18 more COVID-19 uh, test sites across Georgia over the weekend. This brings statewide total to 149 for CVS. At some locations, children 12 years and old are now eligible for testing. You can download the 11 Alive News app for a list of locations. It is in the As Seen on TV section. We keep track of the very latest COVID-19 numbers and trends every day. We break it down county by county. You can find it all in the coronavirus special section on the 11alive.com or the app. Today's National Black Voter Day, the first one ever. And um, it is a day to empower and mobilize black Americans before the November election. Today, Nick Sturdivant spoke with State Senator Nikima Williams, who is running for Congress, about the importance of this movement. The push is not only to make sure voices are heard come election day, but in particular, black voices. And so we have to be intentional about making sure we're doing the educational pieces and reminding people to take the time today, request your absentee ballot, make your plan to vote. Friday marks the first ever National Black Voter Registration Day, a day put together by BET, the National Urban League, and other civil rights organizations. And it's a day that Senator Nakima Williams says holds a lot of importance in Georgia. And we need to center black voices. Black voters are going to decide the margins of this election. Williams was handpicked by Georgia Democrats to be on the ballot in hopes to fill the late Congressman John Lewis's seat in the 5th District, a district, according to census data, that is more than 57% black. Our June primary election, in spite of all of the hurdles that voters had to go through, we saw an increase in black voter turnout. The 5th District is one of the most democratic seats in the entire country. And it's not just black voters, but it is multiracial communities. Williams also faced some heat lately for declining the virtual debate against her Republican opponent and political newcomer, Angela Stanton King. King responding on social media, calling Williams refusal disrespectful and that it shows her elitist attitude. I have a five-year-old son who's in virtual kindergarten upstairs right now, and I work full time and um, I have listened to what Ms. King has said. I ignore her by and large because she does, she's not representative of the values of the 5th Congressional District. More than 100,000 Fulton County voters will be reporting to new precincts in November. Earlier this month, the County Board of Elections announced it's adding 40 new voting sites. It says doing so reduces the number of people at any given site, allowing for better social distancing and shorter waits. If your polling location is changing, the county says you will be notified by mail. As Election Day approaches, here are some dates you will want to mark on your calendar. October 5th is the last day that you can register to vote in the November election. Less than a week later, early in-person voting will begin. And if you want to vote by absentee, if you have to request a ballot, then by October 30th. And then Tuesday, November 3rd will be Election Day. You can find those dates and other key dates on 11alive.com slash vote. Our voter guide gives you a list of other resources to help you secure your vote. Coming up next, calls to grow louder. They, they grow louder to shut down a Georgia detention center after claims that it performed unwanted surgeries on women. Plus, what an Associated Press investigation found about the whistleblower's claims.
Well, this is the last weekend of summer. Fall begins next week, and it's already going to feel like fall as we head through this weekend with some very cool temperatures ahead. So coming up, just how low these temperatures are going to go. Don't forget, we're streaming right now on 11 Alive's YouTube channel. Subscribe, join in on the conversation in the community section. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. Protesters rallying outside the ICE Atlanta field office demanding Georgia and the uh, detention center be shut down. The center's accused of performing unnecessary surgeries on detainees without them fully understanding what was happening. As Mara Seriani reports, the pressure is now mounting for a federal investigation. Leaders of Planned Parenthood and other organizations are backing the victims' claims. They say what's happening inside the Irwin Detention Facility about three hours south of Atlanta is an attempt to stop immigrant women from reproducing. In a complaint filed by the human rights group Project South to the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General, whistleblower Don Wooten detailed the alleged abuse happening inside of the Irwin County Detention Facility. Wooten worked as a nurse at the center in Osceola until July when she was demoted. She claims detained immigrant women are subjected to forced and coerced hysterectomies. Today, representatives from groups including Planned Parenthood, Sister Song, and Project South are calling for the facility to close amid the allegations. We believe that I should be abolished. We know that this is not a system that is for our communities. It is not a system that is committed to making sure that our people survive and thrive. LaSalle Corrections operates the prison. It has yet to comment publicly. In reviewing medical records so far, the Associated Press says it has not found evidence of mass hysterectomies, as was alleged in the former nurse's complaint. Attorneys who spoke to the AP say the doctor in question had performed surgery or treatment on at least eight women at that facility since 2017, including one hysterectomy. You can read more about the story on the 11 Alive app. Just look for the story in the As Seen on TV section. Sally are finally gone, and it was a very tough system, but now there's more activity in the tropics. Meteorologist Samantha Moore is with us for an outlook on what we can expect. Activity, Jeff, and we already have two new storms today. They're both bearing the Greek alphabet, Alpha and Beta. So we had two form just today alone. We're expecting some very active times in the weeks ahead, continuing here. So we're seeing a bit of a drying trend here, though, behind Sally. We've seen that cooler, drier air spilling in.
quite a few clouds, but we think for the most part we're going to be dry as we head into the first half of the weekend and then even drier the second half. Notice the winds here in Rome. You can see the flags are flying pretty good. We've had those winds gusting up around 10 to 15 miles per hour and they'll continue to be rather blustery as we head into our Saturday. So this is what we're thinking as we take a look at what's happening out there right now. You can see that we do have those drier northerly winds moving in and that's bringing in the uh, the drier air. So it's going to cool off more effectively overnight tonight as we head into the overnight hours. We'll definitely see that drying trend ensue here. But as far as those tropics are concerned, it is definitely on the active side as we are now seeing those uh, storms that are going to be named after the Greek alphabet now that we've ran out. Just like in 2005, Katrina year is when we had to use the Greek alphabet before and now we're jumping right into it. And it looks like we're going to get pretty far into that list. 82 is our high today, 67 our low. We should be around 82 and 64 this time of year. And as we head into the next several hours, we're going to see those temperatures get down into the low 60s. And then on our Saturday, we have put a 9 on the wisometer on that scale of 1 to an 11, with 11 being a perfect day, a 9. Temperatures starting out in the low 60s, getting into the low 70s as we head into the afternoon hours. So quite a few clouds around on Saturday. I think Sunday is going to be a prettier day, but tomorrow we'll have those widespread cloud, widespread cloud cover around. It's going to make you feel like fall is, yes, fall is just around the corner. So quite a few clouds out there as we head into the first half of the weekend. It will be staying mostly dry though and then those cool fallish temperatures are going to be coming uh, our way as we head into Sunday Monday and throughout next week in fact so for tonight quite a few clouds around there's going to be a few little drizzly drops out there but I don't think anything truly measurable but there'll be a few little sprinkles and then as we head into our Saturday cloudy throughout much of the afternoon and then by the evening we should start to see things clear a bit and Sunday is looking like a beautiful day with lots of sunshine and we'll end up seeing the dry air move in and those temperatures really cool off overnight. Okay, this is our latest in the Greek alphabet. This is uh, Tropical Storm Beta, which is in the western Gulf of Mexico. It's expected to move parallel to the Texas coast. Now, it doesn't have any true steering winds, so the models have been in disagreement. So the forecast is still a little questionable, but we do believe some of this moisture could get pulled in here by the end of the week. Right now, Beta is a fairly weak storm at 40 mile per hour max sustained wind. Then we have Teddy. Teddy is the opposite of that, a very strong storm, but primarily a fish storm. Right now, we do think it's going to stay off the coast until it gets to eastern Canada, so we'll be watching for that, but it will not impact our coastline or the Carolina coastline. So that's good news as far as uh, that is concerned. And we're looking at more systems out here as well. We have Wilfred. We also have Tropical Storm Alpha, which is affecting Portugal and Spain. And a couple more out here in the coffers that are getting uh, amped up here. We have about a 30 to 40% chance of those developing, this one developing in the Eastern Atlantic. And the one that's coming off the African coast, this tropical wave, only has about a 20% chance of developing as we head into the next five days. But still a very active pattern ahead, so we'll continue to monitor the tropics for you. For your Saturday, temperatures starting out in the low 60s, getting into the low 70s. Lots of cloud cover during the day. More sunshine on Sunday after a very chilly start. We start out in the mid 50s, getting into the low 70s during the afternoon, and we're down to the upper 40s to near 50 degrees on Tuesday, the first day of fall. It's going to start out crisp and fall-like, and then we'll end up seeing uh, that pattern hold for the rest of next week, staying dry at least through the end of next week. Nearly 200 cats will be staying in Atlanta for a while. After their shelter was damaged during the hurricane, the Safe Harbor Animal Shelter is in South Alabama, north of where the storm hit when their building was damaged. They called the Atlanta Humane Society for help, and this evening the disaster response team headed down to pick up the cats. There they are. They are ready to be in Atlanta to look around. In the meantime, the Humane Society is trying to raise money to get Harbor Animal Shelter up and running again. A lot of great pets there. Virtual, in person, a hybrid of both. Teachers certainly have a lot on their plates right now. But one Coweta County teacher is taking the job one step further to make her students smile. Cheryl Freheim has the story. Welcome to Latasha Washington Williams's new classroom. It's the best day ever. For 17 years, she's been teaching family and consumer science at East Coweta High School. When the district decided to approach hybrid learning this year, she knew she had to get creative. I had to figure out a way 
to get my te my my students interested in logging on. She opted for a subtle virtual entrance. <laughs> Every day, she dons a different costume for her kids. They say that it takes 2.7 seconds to catch someone's attention. We have fun here I have 30 kids, four blocks, 120 students. They all log on. And it's that, that 2.7 seconds that I have to get them to log on and be interested. Of course, she's got her favorite looks. The Marshmallow Man. That's my absolute favorite. And then I also love the one when I did the Frozen because I just love that song. Love is an open door. It is. Tasha says it may sound simple or silly, but it is important for her students. They are having to get adjusted to this new normal of not everyone being at school. And if I can just do something for them for, for 90 minutes to make them laugh while they're learning, I feel like I've done my job. It's crazy times, but we're making the best out of it. Still to come, urban coyotes causing trouble for some Metro homeowners. Man, we do this story every fall, and there is no easy answer, no solution to keeping these guys out of your yard and away from your pets. We talked to an expert about his solution to the problem. It's expensive. We'll tell you about that coming up. Then mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information. Well, 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. So when you reached out to us about a story about coyotes causing trouble all around Atlanta, we are in. We're listening. We want to help. Here goes. Our story focused on the issue in Buckhead where coyotes had attacked pets and those in the neighborhood had hired a trapper to deal with the issue. But viewers wanted to make sure the neighborhoods know that other options don't necessarily involve traps. Dr. Chris Mowry, a biologist at Berry College in Rome, is one of those who reached out. He helped create the Coyote Project to teach people about coyotes, how to live with them. Dr. Mowry says trapping them might disrupt their family structure and create bigger litters in the future. And he suggests keeping them off your property using other means. We also had some suggest, like in our original story, that you keep pet food bowls inside, you secure your trash cans, you 
keep an eye on your bird feeders and you keep your pet on a leash when you let them out. That's so hard to do, almost impossible. But Dr. Mowry suggests you take this even further, installing motion activated lights to frighten off coyotes, using a hose or noisemakers to scare them away from your property. And he also has an idea that's very expensive. Listen to this. Building fences, fences that are six to eight feet tall that might have rollers on the top of them because we have seen that coyotes can actually are they're pretty good at climbing fences so when the coyote gets to the top of the fence it, it can't get over top of it so that's something i mean if you're talking about building a, a six to an eight feet fence with rollers i mean you're talking about spending five ten thousand dollars right it's a lot of money for a creature that constantly is adapting now, Dr. Mowry says these measures work best when your neighbors also are on board and they follow the guidelines and purchase an expensive fence too, I guess. It is not easy. I have them in my yard too, and, and I know uh, our neighbors try to deal with them as well. Everybody in Atlanta, no matter where you are, you have to watch your pets. You have to ever be vigilant about them because these guys are in your backyard, particularly during the fall. Uh, some of his other suggestions, we have a link to the Coyote Project in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app, or you can look for the story on the homepage of 11alive.com. I did a story in Virginia Highland about five years ago with a guy who had a uh, much simpler idea on how to deal with him. <laughs> we got a lot of response to that. Coming up next, both candidates in Minnesota today as the November election draws closer. Chuck Todd weighs in on how the buzz about a COVID-19 vaccine potential could impact votes. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your... Following breaking news tonight, as you have heard earlier in this broadcast, 
U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died at the age of 87. We are told she died today in her Washington, D.C. home of complications from pancreatic cancer. Again, she was 87 years of age, the oldest member of the Supreme Court. The longtime justice was appointed to the bench by President Clinton in 1993. Tracy Potts has a closer look at her important life and her impact on shaping the law and shaping the destiny of the United States. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg spent more than a quarter century on the U.S. Supreme Court and spent much of her career fighting for equality. How wrong it is to judge people on the basis of what they look like. Born in Brooklyn, New York, she tied for first in her class at Columbia Law, but with no job offers from law firms, this was the late 50s, she taught at Rutgers and Columbia, then helped launch the ACLU Women's Rights Project in the 70s. Later, as their lawyer, she won five of six cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Her ultimate goal was to get sex discrimination treated by the, sa by the Supreme Court the same way that race discrimination was treated. From the Court of Appeals, President Clinton made her the second female on the nation's highest court, where she continued to even the playing field, ending male-only college admissions, supporting reproductive rights and the LGBTQ community. While her rulings leaned liberal, off the bench, she was close friends with the late conservative justice Antonin Scalia. In her 80s, Ginsburg became popular with a new generation, celebrated in the book The Notorious RBG and parodied on Saturday Night Live. I'm never going to step down now. You can't get rid of me. There's this whole new generation of young people who really admire her and think of her as, you know, kind of a rock star. Justice Ginsburg spoke out about the Me Too movement. It is as effective for the woman who works as a maid in a hotel as it is for Hollywood stars. A wife, a mother, a grandmother, an advocate for equality for nearly half a century. Joining me right now, 11 Alive political analyst Dr. Andra Gillespie from Emory University, a diminutive woman in size but a towering figure in the history of the country and the U.S. Supreme Court in her impact, her progressive politics, yet at the same time this was a, a very, very human person who was uh, warm to the touch and, and the other thing about her, Dr. Gillespie, is she came up at a time in the 1960s when women were not in law school. You, you just didn't see them. Um, yeah, I mean, Rick, uh, Justice Ginsburg is a pioneer in women's rights and making sure that uh, the law was used to protect the rights of women and to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, you know, that's how she... Uh, made her name to fame. That's how she got on the radar. People like Bill Clinton, who um, nominated her to the Supreme Court, and she certainly kept that up as uh, through her rulings. And so if you look at the things that she was writing on, she uh, was definitely a champion of women's rights, a champion of civil rights, more broadly speaking. Um, and just given the balance of power in the courts and the fact that she is dying during the administration of a Republican president, it's very likely um, that President Trump will not nominate somebody who, from an ideological standpoint, is going to be very different from her and whose judicial philosophy is likely going to be very different from hers. So how does this work? Can Democrats slow this down? Can they block anything that President Trump does? How does that play out? Give me a sense of that. Well, I mean, so what we expect uh, is that President Trump is going to nominate somebody to try to fill the seat very quickly. Uh, we've known in the last couple of weeks that he's already put out a list of names of potential Supreme Court nominees. He was doing that for campaign purposes. He's likely going to draw from that list and make a nomination. He's going to have the support of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who, although he blocked the nomination of Merrick Garland in 2016, when um, Justice Antonin Scalia passed away, um, he's likely to try to make this happen. And I think the big question is going to be whether or not the Republican uh, Senate conference is actually going to go along with that. Um, there could be some uh, Republican senators, particularly ones who are running in close electoral contests, who may feel skittish about doing that and might worry about the backlash of looking hypocritical after blocking the Merrick nomination in 2016. So we have to see whether or not Senator McConnell can actually keep the Republican coalition together in order to push through a nomination. I think that with Justice Ginsburg, 
Ginsburg's death, uh, it, it sort of foregrounds the importance of the court. It was already important um, when you listen to President Trump's stump speech. He talks about his judicial nominations as uh, as an area in which you know he kept a promise, um, and we know that there are many Republican voters who have been motivated to support President Trump despite everything um, that has happened in the administration, um, in part because they care about what the balance of the federal judiciary looks like. And so this is another reason that President Trump might use to try to appeal to them. I think what's likely to happen on the Democratic side is that the courts are going to come to the forefront in ways that we hadn't seen before. And we know that in previous elections, Republican voters might have been more um, uh, activated by what they thought the court composition is going to be. I would expect that Democratic voters are going to be equally animated by what they think is a fight for the federal judiciary and important rulings, um, you know, with respect to civil rights, with respect to abortion and other issues. Dr. Andrew Gillespie from Emory University, as always, we appreciate your insight. Thanks for being with us on a Thank Friday you. night on late notice. We really do appreciate it. Thanks again. All right, Thanks. reaching for a long shot, President Trump campaigning in Minnesota tonight, a state that hasn't gone red in nearly 50 years. Former Vice President Biden was there as well, visiting a union training center. And although the polls show President Trump trailing uh, Mr. Biden in the state, his campaign sees a window of opportunity. The president lost the state by a small margin in 2016. Now he's looking to close the gap. Early voting began in Minnesota today, along with Virginia and South Dakota. The presidential campaign kicking into high gear now with the election just six weeks from Tuesday. A lot to talk about. Here's NBC's Chuck Todd, who joined Natisha Lance earlier today. With less than 50 days until Election Day, both President Trump and Joe Biden on the campaign trail. And in fact, both are visiting my home state, Minnesota, on Friday. Well, joining me now is Chuck Todd, moderator of NBC's Meet the Press. Good to see you, Chuck. So you have Ch you have uh, Bob Woodard on Meet the Press on Sunday, and his book had some bombshell revelations. So what has been the fallout? Has the president's comments about the coronavirus changed anything for voters, as far as what you can tell? Look, we've actually we actually tried to measure this in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, and you know I don't think any single revelation has been. Uh, has impacted the president, but I, uh, on any of these books that have come out and these revelations. But you know what they have done? They've not helped him. And, uh, and the point is this: he's he may not he may not have lost any new voters, but right now he is stuck in the mid to low 40s, uh, particularly in the northern battlegrounds. He's in a better, slightly better shape in the southern battlegrounds, where he's in the mid to high 40s. Donald Trump's biggest problem right now is he can't win back the same people that voted for him the first time. And I think these accumulation, this accumulation of, of, of bad anecdotes with Woodward, with the Atlantic Magazine article from a week before, all of this, I think it prevents him from essentially getting some of these skeptical Trumpers. You know, you have the never Trumpers, but there's a group of what I call skeptical Trumpers. Um, they want to come home, and yet these stories prevent them from coming home. It's that gray area right there. Will you also have... HHS Secretary Azar on your show on Sunday and a COVID vaccine from what we've been hearing seems to be getting closer. But how legitimate is the concern that the race for that vaccine has become too politicized? Well, the public seems to be concerned. Only 20. We had a, a survey out earlier this week, NBC Survey Monkey, uh, that had only 26 percent trusted what they heard from the president on the vaccine. 52 percent did not trust what they heard from him. I think that the biggest challenge for the government and the vaccine is to get the politicians out from talking about it. The more the president puts a stamp of approval on, the more polarizing and divisive that becomes. The more Anthony Fauci tells you that a vaccine is okay, the more comfortable the public is. So I do think when it comes to the vaccine, um, if it is safe and, and, the, and the scientists feel good about it, the last person marketing it, might it, you might not want it to be any partisan politician, whether it's Trump or Biden. Um, because, you know, you almost want to take the politics out of this. And, you know, my concern is that this thing's already been so politicized. That, mm -hmm. And if you only get, say, 50 percent of the country that's comfortable taking this vaccine, well, we're going to be living, then we're going to have to, even if you're vaccinated, you know, people are going to be wearing masks. Um, it doesn't really get us back to normal. So this is going to be quite the challenge. And I, and I, I worry that we're already way behind on getting sort of uh, people comfortable with a vaccine. And for us, if we if you live in Metro Atlanta for here, you see nothing but those political ads for the presidential race. But also we have two U.S. Senate races that are going on here in Georgia as well. So what have you seen in terms right. of polling numbers that would give Democrats or Republicans more confidence about what happens here in November? 
Well, I'll tell you this. I, I think a lot of us in the political sort of uh, information world uh, that, that, that do this for a living, I think all of us expected at some point that, well, maybe Republicans will start pulling away in Georgia, as they always do come this time of year, and you're not seeing that. And I think the bigger conclusion I've come to is that the Atlanta, the change in the Atlanta suburbs is just like the change we're seeing in the suburbs, whether they're Philadelphia, Indianapolis, Detroit, Phoenix, Denver, Houston, Dallas. The trend line is the same, and I think you're seeing it uh, in a big way in the Atlanta suburbs. And, and so, I, I, look, my biggest takeaway is, is, you know, I think we have undercovered and uh, underplayed the David Perdue Senate seat. I think a lot of attention has been given to the, to the other seat, and sort of a, the Kelly Loeffler story, obviously her initial story, she had a, a little more of a brand name, and that's a very contentious uh, all-candidate race. But I tell you, when I saw David Perdue have to put up the ad about his stocks, having to, had to put up his own, having to advertise saying, hey, I did nothing wrong, but having to confront that issue. Um, I, look, I think Democrats are in a lot better shape in Georgia than I ever expected them to be this close to November. All right. Always good insight from you. Meet the Press airs Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on 11 Live. Chuck, thanks so much. It sounds like it's going to be a great show. Coming up, details on a new proposal that would forgive up to $50,000 in student loan debt for Americans suffering financially because of the pandemic. Live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Elizabeth Warren have introduced a proposal that would cancel federal student loan debt due to the coronavirus pandemic. They are asking the president to forgive up to $50,000 per borrower. In recent years, student debt has reached new record highs. 
totaling more than $1.5 trillion. As temporary relief, the Department of Education has paused student loan payments until the end of the year. And while students are struggling, so are universities. Many colleges and universities are, are struggling with severe budget problems. Let's connect the dots between the pandemic and higher education. We all know college can be expensive, forcing parents and students to go into debt just to pay for it. Thanks to coronavirus, more students are deciding to take a year off. Some have health concerns, and many report worrying about paying tuition. But that tuition money is not the only place where colleges make their money. There are actually three sources of funds for higher education. Tuition, the federal government, and state governments. When the system was initially put in place, state governments were supposed to shoulder the most cost. This led to widespread affordable higher education options at state schools after World War II. But the trouble started when state government suffered budget shortfalls. Higher education was a prime target for cuts because schools could always raise tuition to make up the money. So in pretty much every economic downturn since the 80s, states have cut money for colleges and universities, leaving many schools in a precarious position heading into this pandemic. Well, the tropics continue to be very active. Of course, our Hurricane Sally, no longer a tropical system, has moved well out to sea here. And in its wake, we're seeing those cooler, drier conditions move in with the drier air spilling in. We also have a bit of a northeasterly flow, and that tends to wedge us in a bit, bringing in cooler, cloudier conditions. So that's going to be the case as we head into the first half of the weekend. So our high temperatures today, this is as warm as we're going to be in a while. We were at 83 in Atlanta and Athens, 82 in Marietta, 83 in Rome. And we're not going to get near that any time within the next seven days. It is going to be so unseasonably cool. So right now it feels pretty good out there. It feels like 70. It is 70 in Canton, 70 in Dalton, 73 in Marietta. It's 69 in Carrollton and 70 in Covington. And the next 12 hours, we'll see those temperatures get down into the mid to low 60s overnight. Quite a few clouds. When you step out this tomorrow morning, you're going to be like, oh man, it's kind of gray out here. And we're going to have to wait to the afternoon to see some peaks of sunshine. So we're going to be kind of socked in throughout much of the day. Temperatures start out fairly seasonal right around 63 degrees and then we'll be in the low 70s by the afternoon. But it is going to be quite cloudy throughout the day. There may be a few spits of drizzle as well from time to time, especially in the mountains. But I think for the most part, it's going to be mostly dry. So this is what we're expecting overnight. That widespread cloud cover during the overnight hours. Yeah, a few showers trying to work their way into Athens before midnight and during the early morning hours, maybe in Marietta over towards Carrollton, just some very light drizzle probably won't even measure up to one one hundredth of an inch. So just some very light stuff. We stay quiet, cloudy until the late afternoon and then we start to clear it out a bit. So Sunday's looking a lot better. We'll see the sunshine as we head through the day becoming more omnipresent, the clouds moving out and those temperatures dropping as we head into the overnight hours. So widespread overcast for Saturday. We're staying mostly dry though and then those fallish temperatures are going to be settling in as we head into next week. In fact, throughout the weekend, that cooler air is going to be to our north and some of that's going to get uh, drawn in by our northerly flow as we head in through the weekend. So as far as what we can expect for our Saturday morning, right around the mid 60s as you head out the door and then for Sunday morning that's when we're going to see the temperatures down in the mid 50s here in Atlanta 52 in Rome 51 in Blairsville maybe even some upper 40s here yeah it's going to be great apple picking weather I know last weekend everyone was sweating up there picking apples not this weekend it's going to be perfect and the first day of fall is Tuesday of this week so this is the last weekend of summer and fall begins on Tuesday and those fall like temperatures definitely settling in I can't remember a fall starting out where it actually feels like fall for a change, but we're definitely going to feel it with the crisp, cool conditions. We'll see plenty of sunshine as we head into next week, and it looks like we'll have to watch some of that rain from a possible tropical system by the end of next week. But for the meantime, it is going to be beautiful fall like sunshine. <laughs> Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks.
Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Six Flags Over Georgia opened again today for Hallow Fest, the park making some adjustments because of the pandemic. If you are thinking about paying with cash, not going to happen. They will not allow you to use cash anywhere inside the park. Only credit card, debit cards, mobile pay options will be accepted. That includes Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, Apple Pay, Google Pay, and other debit transactions. Bank AmeriCard will not be accepted. Six Flags is one of the first theme parks to make this change. Bank AmeriCard has not been around since about 1968. I didn't get anyone smiling here in the studio. Coming up, this teenager's flying high in the sky before she can even get behind the wheel of a car. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. She's not quite ready to be out on the road, but in the sky, that's no issue for a young aviator in Arlington, Virginia. Thousands of you were inspired by her story when we posted on the 11 Alive Facebook page. So Jess Arland with our sister station in Washington, D.C., sat down with a 17-year-old to talk about her flying goals for the future. This Arlington High Schooler flew an airplane before she drove a car, and that's just the beginning for this aspiring naval aviator. That's 17 year old Nyla Williamson flying the plane. Oh, I had not even taken my driver's classes, so definitely different priorities than other teenagers in life. She got on a flight simulator in sixth grade. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And then I decided since then that I wanted to pursue flying. Two weeks ago, she passed her written exam to become a pilot. She plans to earn that license before she graduates as she works toward becoming a naval aviator in the Marine Corps, a position held by few women. It's a uh, learning as you go experience, just being willing to make mistakes, but then learn from them, not being afraid of failure. As a potential fourth generation service member, Nyla hopes to follow in the footsteps of women like Virginia native Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swagel. She's the Navy's first black female tactical fighter pilot. Seeing someone who looked just like me pursuing the same dreams I had was completely inspirational. Now, She's determined to log those 40 hours. She says she needs to earn her license. Maybe one day I can be a first in some area too. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight, the nation grieving the loss of iconic Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She passed away today from pancreatic cancer at the age of 87. Right now, mourners have started to gather in front of the Supreme Court. They are lighting candles in her memory and laying roses on the stone steps and flags at the U.S. Capitol have also been lowered to half staff by order of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Tracy Potts takes a look back at the life and legacy of a woman who inspired and fought for generations of Americans and who is affectionately called the Notorious RBG. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg spent more than a quarter century on the U.S. Supreme Court and spent much of her career fighting for equality. How wrong it is to judge people on the basis of what they look like. Born in Brooklyn, New York, she tied for first in her class at Columbia Law. But with no job offers from law firms, this was the late 50s, she taught at Rutgers and Columbia then helped launch the ACLU Women's Rights Project in the 70s. Later, as their lawyer, she won five of six cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Her ultimate goal was to get sex discrimination treated by the, sa by the Supreme Court the same way that race discrimination was treated. From the Court of Appeals, President Clinton made her the second female on the nation's highest court, where she continued to even the playing field, ending male-only college admissions, supporting reproductive rights and the LGBTQ community. While her rulings leaned liberal, off the bench, she was close friends with the late conservative justice Antonin Scalia. In her 80s, Ginsburg became popular with a new generation, celebrated in the book The Notorious RBG and parodied on Saturday Night Live. I'm never going to step down now. You can't get rid of me. 
me. <laughs> There's this whole new generation of young people who really admire her and think of her as, you know, kind of a rock star. Justice Ginsburg spoke out about the Me Too movement. It is as effective for the woman who works as a maid in a hotel as it is for Hollywood stars. A wife, a mother, a grandmother, an advocate for equality for nearly half a century. For the first time, we are hearing directly from the man punched by Clayton County deputies during a traffic stop. Roderick Walker was just released from jail last night, so today was our first chance to ask him about what happened. Joe Henke was able to catch up with him as Walker's attorney raised new concerns about the deputies. An emotional Roderick Walker during a press conference today, one week after cell phone images show Clayton County Sheriff's deputies pinning him to the ground while punching him. I was scared. I feel for my life, just pray, just hope that it don't happen to nobody else. On Thursday, the Clayton County Sheriff's Office identified the deputies holding down Walker as Brandon Myers and Dakota Riddick. Walker was arrested for battery and obstructing officers. Video of the arrest went viral, and then Deputy Myers, who was hired last November and still was on probationary status with the Sheriff's Office, was fired for excessive force. The Clayton County District Attorney is now investigating. Walker's attorney, Sean Williams, is calling for Deputy Riddick to also be fired. In his own report, acknowledges amidst, amidst the beating Mr. Walker in the head should have also been terminated. Williams also called into question other cases involving Deputy Myers. We've learned Mr. Myers had prior incidents similar to Mr. Walker's. Williams provided five reports today of Myers using various forms of force to arrest people since joining the force in November. 11 Alive has not independently received the reports from Clayton County, but none of the reports detail injuries to deputies or citizens. In all five incidents, Sheriff's Office supervisors found Myers followed department policy. The incident report for Walker's arrest details Riddick stopping a vehicle for a broken taillight and a front seat passenger not wearing a seatbelt. Walker, the passenger, was asked for ID. The report claims Walker refused to identify himself. And when Riddick attempted to detain Walker, he ran and fought Riddick and Myers. Williams refutes Walker not wearing a seatbelt or being an aggressor. He was being beaten in his head. He was tased, continuously beaten over and over again. They used an illegal, in my view, choke hold on him that almost killed him. Walker's attorneys say he lost consciousness twice and since bonding out of jail, doctors have diagnosed him with a mild traumatic brain injury, cognitive problems, headaches, dizziness, a left eye injury, nerve damage to his arm, as well as jaw and knee injuries. Well, this is an unnerving story. A Brookhaven couple is attacked by an intruder inside their own home. And tonight we've learned the su su suspect behind bars had just been released from prison 45 days ago for an eerily similar attack. 11 Alive's Latasha Gibbons is on the story all new tonight. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. This body camera footage shows Brookhaven police arresting Jimmy Mills after officers say he stabbed a man and attacked a woman inside their home on North Jordan Hills Road Thursday afternoon. Police say the wife was in the shower when Mills confronted her. I came into the home and pulled back the shower curtain, uh, at, which of course caused her to scream. Uh, in response to her scream, her husband came from another room. Lieutenant Davis Snively says Mills stabbed the husband in the face and stomach several times. Both of them are, are traumatized by this incident. It's really, truly the, the thing that nightmares are made of. Police say Mills ran off and home surveillance video shows him allegedly trying to break into another home before he was arrested on Village Point. Police records show Mills broke into another Brookhaven home back in 2015 and attacked two women. They fought back and Mills ran off, according to police. But in 2016, Mr. Mills pled guilty. Uh, he was sentenced to 8 to 15 years in custody. Uh, but here in 2020, just four years later, uh, he was released. Uh, and about 45 days after his release, uh, he's committing another identical violent offense. The department says it's concerned Mills was granted parole so soon. Every branch of the criminal justice system has a role to play uh, in making sure that offenders are rehabilitated and held accountable. That a violent repeat offender uh, was released in, in such form that he continued to prey on other members of our community. 
Under Georgia law, most inmates are eligible for parole after serving a third of their sentence. There are exceptions for more violent crimes and repeat offenders. In Mills case, the parole board says he served more than half of his sentence before he was paroled in August. There's now a warrant hold for him, so he cannot be released on bond. Let's take a look at some other top headlines. We now know the name of a woman killed when a tree fell on her as she was walking her dog yesterday. Gwinnett County Fire says 71 year old Lynn Alice Trapp was pinned under the tree on Capit Court. She was one of two people who died in Metro Atlanta as the remnants of Hurricane Sally pushed their way through toppling trees. A fire at a Gwinnett County apartment complex leaving some people without a home tonight. Gwinnett fire crews say four top floor apartment units were destroyed after a blaze ripped through the Bella Apartments in Norcross, causing heavy damage there. It took crews more than two hours to put the fire out. No word on any injuries. Apartment management and the American Red Cross are helping those displaced. Starting this Sunday, the Commerce Department plans to restrict access to the popular social media app TikTok. At first, you'll still be able to use it, but there won't be any new downloads. So if you don't have it yet, you're probably not going to be able to get it. The bigger issue will be in November when the ban on crucial services like Internet hosting takes effect. The crackdown comes amid allegations. The app is collecting huge amounts of data from users and its connection to China's military and intelligence services. Taking a look now at some coronavirus headlines today, the CDC is now reversing its controversial guidance on testing asymptomatic people. Under the new guidelines, if you are exposed to an infected person for at least 15 minutes, you should get tested if you're not showing any symptoms. So get tested even if not showing symptoms. The new guidance also recommends people self isolate while they wait for test results and they should still stay home for 14 days even if the test comes back negative. Georgia reported 63 additional COVID deaths today, sending our numbers back up after being down for several days. The past two days have been significantly higher than our current average of 43 deaths. We spotted a trend in the data today, and while the numbers are very small, there has been a steady increase in COVID deaths among 18 to 29 year olds. This group has seen the most number of cases with more than 76,000. But from July 1st to today, the number of deaths has grown from 14 to 51. That is faster than any other time during the pandemic. CVS is adding 18 more COVID-19 drive through testing sites across Georgia this weekend. So that brings the statewide total to 149 sites. At some locations, children 14 years old and up are now eligible for testing. You can download the 11 Live News app for a list of locations. It is in the As Seen on TV section. Testing for coronavirus without leaving your home? Well, we are connecting the dots on how this new testing could work out. Finding out if you have coronavirus could soon be as simple as grabbing a nasal swab and opening an app. Let's connect the dots. A computer company and a biotech company have announced the creation of a rapid at-home COVID-19 test. Think of it like a home pregnancy test, just without the plus and minus symbols. The company says the test can detect coronavirus in 90% of cases, compared to the nearly 100% accuracy you get with the PCR test, the one where the nasal swab is stuck all the way up the nasal cavity. So how does it work? According to the makers, you use a nasal swab on both nostrils, then put the swab in a small vial of solution provided. Four droplets from the tube are placed on a rapid test base, and then lines will form depending on how much of all the virus is found. You use an app to scan the lines, and it tells you the results, all within 15 minutes. Now this test is not on the market yet and still needs to be evaluated by the FDA to see if all the claims hold up. And according to reports, there is still no word on what it would cost, but cheap, effective at-home tests could be an important weapon to stop the spread of COVID-19. We keep track of the latest COVID-19 numbers and trends every day, and we even break it down county by county for you. You can find it all in the coronavirus special section on 11alive.com or the 11alive app. Up next, calls grow louder to shut down a Georgia detention center after claims it performed unwanted surgeries on women. Plus, what an Associated Press investigation found out about the whistleblower's claims. 
Well, this is the last weekend of summer and fall begins next Tuesday and between now and then it is certainly going to feel like fall. So coming up what you can expect for this weekend and just how low those temperatures could go. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation with us right there in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. Protesters rallying outside the ICE Atlanta field office demanding a Georgia detention center be shut down. The center is accused of performing unnecessary surgeries on detainees without them fully understanding what was happening. As Mara Sirianni reports, the pressure is now mounting for a federal investigation. Leaders of Planned Parenthood and other organizations are backing the victims' claims. They say what's happening inside the Irwin Detention Facility about three hours south of Atlanta is an attempt to stop immigrant women from reproducing. In a complaint filed by the human rights group Project South to the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General, whistleblower Don Wooten detailed the alleged abuse happening inside of the Irwin County Detention Facility. Wooten worked as a nurse at the center in Osceola until July when she was demoted. She claims detained immigrant women are subjected to forced and coerced hysterectomies. Today, representatives from groups including Planned Parenthood, Sister Song and Project South are calling for the facility to close amid the allegations. We believe that I should be abolished. We know that this is not a system that is for our communities. It is not a system that is committed to making sure that our people survive and thrive. LaSalle Corrections operates the prison. It has yet to comment publicly. In reviewing medical records so far, the Associated Press says it has not found evidence of mass hysterectomies as was alleged in the former nurse's complaint. Attorneys who spoke to the AP say the doctor in question had performed surgery or treatment on at least eight women at the facility since 2017, including one hysterectomy. You can read more about the story on the 11 Alive app. Just look for the story in the As Seen on TV section. Well, 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, so when you reached out to us about a story we did on coyotes causing problems in Metro Atlanta, we listened to you. Our story focused on the issue in a Buckhead community where coyotes had attacked people's pets. The people in the neighborhood had hired a trapper to deal with the issue, but viewers wanted to make sure neighborhoods know there are other options that don't involve traps. Dr. Chris Mowry, who's a biology biologist at Berry College near Rome, was one of the people who reached out to us and he helped create the Coyote Project to teach people about coyotes and how to live with them. Mowry says trapping them could disrupt their family structure and possibly create bigger litters in the future. So his suggestion, keeping them off your property by using other means. Now, some that we suggested in our original story were keeping pet food bowls inside, securing your trash cans, and keeping your pet on a leash when you let them out. 
But Maori also suggests going even further by installing motion activated lights to frighten off coyotes and even using a hose or noisemaker if they do enter your property to scare them away. So uh, he says you can also build a physical barrier. Building fences, fences that are six to eight feet tall that might have rollers on the top of them because we have seen that coyotes can actually are they're pretty good at climbing fences so when the coyote gets to the top of the fence it, it can't get over top of it so that's something Maori says these measures work best when all of your neighbors are working together and they're all on board to follow those guidelines for some of his other suggestions we have a link for you to uh, the coyote project in the as seen on tv section of the 11 live app or look for the story on the homepage of 11alive.com. Well, are you ready for the last weekend of summer? It's not gonna feel nearly as hot as it did last weekend. It's actually going to be kind of chilly, especially Sunday morning. It's definitely going to be unseasonably cool and breezy as well. Some of our peak guests today up around 25 to even uh, almost 30 miles per hour, 28 miles per hour in Dalton, 26 mile per hour gusts in Rome. And as we look out over Rome, you can see it's still pretty breezy out there. We're going to be breezy again as we head into Saturday. So that'll make it feel even a little bit cooler, especially tomorrow night if you're out on the town. Let's go ahead and take a look at that radar and show you what happened to Sally. Hurricane Sally is no more, has moved out into the open waters of the Atlantic and has lost any tropical characteristics whatsoever. And we're seeing that drier air move in behind it. So we have a bit of a northerly flow here and that's bringing in drier, cooler air as we head into the overnight hours and in through the weekend, the drier air will filter in and that means those overnight lows are going to continue to uh, drop as we head into the next few nights. So our high temperatures today is as hot as it's going to get for at least the next week. This will be the hottest day we have had because or we will have because we're going to be down in the 70s every day after this, at least for the next week. So 83 was our high in Athens, 83 in Gainesville, 83 in Rome and 83 in Atlanta. So pretty much where we should be this time of year. And overnight tonight, we won't be far off the mark either. Lots of cloud cover overnight and into tomorrow as well. So tomorrow's gonna look kind of gray when you get up, but don't despair, it's not gonna be rainy. There may be a few sprinkles around, especially the first half of the day. And then during the afternoon, we should start to see those clouds thinning out a little bit, but it's still gonna appear pretty overcast throughout the day on Saturday. And then come Sunday, we'll start to see some changes. So there are the clouds we're expecting to see, maybe a few little sprinkles in Athens as we head towards midnight or tomorrow morning, maybe over into Marietta, Carrollton, just a few little sprinkles. And then once we get to the afternoon hours, it'll be dry and those clouds will start to break up a little bit. And then getting into Sunday morning, we'll end up seeing the clouds scooting out throughout the day and more return, the return of the sunshine. And we'll see uh, those temperatures starting to cool off as we head into next week, big time. So tracking the tropics, we have now started to use the Greek alphabet. We've been talking about that just like we did back in 2005. This is only the second time we've had to do that. And now we're already up to beta. We had three storms named today. We had the W storm, we had alpha and beta. So here is beta expected to impact the Texas coast this weekend. And maybe some of that moisture will work its way in here at the end of next week. Then we have Teddy. Teddy's going to affect Bermuda here. They have warnings lifted right now, and then it's going to most likely affect eastern Canada, but our east coast looks like it's going to be okay. And then we have Alpha. This formed earlier today off the coast of Portugal. It's going to die out pretty quickly, become extra tropical this weekend. And then we have Williford. Williford was the last storm on our normal list. It is expected to move to the northwest and weaken as it does go that way. So that's good. We're not expecting it to impact the east coast either. So what we do expect to impact us is going to be the cooler temperatures that'll be spilling in as we head in towards fall. So over the weekend, temperatures getting down into the mid 50s on your Sunday morning, low 70s during the afternoon on Sunday, and then we stay kind of cool right around 50 degrees. Our lows will be in the low 70s. Fall begins on Tuesday, and it looks like we're going to be staying dry most of next week. Efforts to engage black voters are ramping up ahead of the November election. Now there's even an entire day dedicated to the cause. We are breaking down what it's all about next. 
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for 97. Today is National Black Voter Day, and it is the first one ever. It's a day to empower and mobilize black Americans before the November election. Today, Nick Sturdivant spoke with State Senator Nakima Williams, who is running for Congress, about the importance of this movement. The push is not only to make sure voices are heard come election day, but in particular, black voices. And so we have to be intentional about making sure we're doing the educational pieces and reminding people to take the time today, request your absentee ballot, make your plan to vote. Friday marks the first ever National Black Voter Registration Day, a day put together by BET, the National Urban League, and other civil rights organizations. And it's a day that Senator Nakima Williams says holds a lot of importance in Georgia. And we need to center black voices. Black voters are going to decide the margins of this election. Williams was handpicked by Georgia Democrats to be on the ballot in hopes to fill the late Congressman John Lewis's seat in the 5th District, a district, according to census data, that is more than 57% black. Our June primary election, in spite of all of the hurdles that voters had to go through, we saw an increase in black voter turnout. The 5th District is one of the most democratic seats in the entire country, and it's not just black voters, but it is multiracial communities. Williams also faced some heat lately for declining the virtual debate against her Republican opponent and political newcomer, Angela Stanton King. King responding on social media, calling Williams' refusal disrespectful and that it shows her elitist attitude. I have a five-year-old son who's in virtual kindergarten upstairs right now, and I work full-time, and um, I have listened to what Ms. King has said. I ignore her by and large because she just, she's not representative of the values of the 5th Congressional District. More than 100,000 Fulton County voters reporting to new precincts come November. Earlier this month, the Fulton County Board of Elections announced increasing the number of polling locations throughout the county, adding 40 vo voting sites. If your polling location is changing, the Fulton County Board of Registration and Elections says you will be notified by mail. You can find those dates and other key dates on 11alive.com vote. Our voter guide gives you a list of other resources to help sh help you secure your vote rather.
postal workers and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, we continue to follow the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She passed away today in her Washington, D.C. home of complications from metastatic pancreatic cancer. She was 87 years old. We are showing you live picture. That is a crowd that continues to grow in front of the Supreme Court, lighting candles in her memory and laying roses on the stone steps. I am joined by former federal prosecutor and current defense attorney Brett Williams. Brett, good to see you. So what is the legal legacy of Justice Ginsburg? What does she leave behind? Well, first, she's a titan and an amazing jurist, was an amazing jurist. And what she leaves behind is a legacy of, of, of being a wonderful Supreme Court justice, an advocate for the rule of law and the rightness of law. I don't know if people know, her nickname among certain people was the notorious RBG oh, yeah. because of her commitment. Yes, absolutely. We that was that did become her affectionate name, nickname. She was also known as a Supreme Court justice who was more liberal. What kind of void will she leave in the court? Well, and people say liberal. Uh, it was a, an approach to the law and to justice. And the void she'll leave is to is being that vote and that voice and that advocate for that particular set of values, that outlook. And that's one of the things that we lose on the court by losing her as an associate justice is that voice, that advocate, that perspective in the marketplace of ideas. 
You know, and as we are approaching an election coming up in November, what are your thoughts on what happens next, especially since her her, her death is so close to that election? Will they reelect someone new or will they wait until afterwards? What are your thoughts? Well, and those are uh, two options. And one of the things that's going to be, I think, unfortunate is this may become a football, uh, as many people can remember with the nominee Justice uh, Merrick Garland under Obama, the previous president, uh, that nomination got held up. The Senate wouldn't hold a vote. And ultimately, uh, Gorsuch was nominated uh, and put on the court by the current president after the election, mm -hmm. much to the current consternation of the Democrats and possibly delight of Republicans. The question is whether her seat will become that type of political football in this, given it's so close to the election. Well, I suppose only time will tell. She has such a rich legacy that she leaves behind, a staunch fighter for women's rights, an icon for sure, always known as the notorious RBG. Brett Williams, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Reaching for a long shot, President Trump campaigning in Minnesota today, a state that hasn't gone red in nearly 50 years, Former Vice President Biden was there as well, visiting a union training center. And although the polls show President Trump trailing behind Biden in the state, his campaign sees a window of opportunity there. The president lost the state by just a small margin back in 2016, and now he's looking to close that gap. Early voting began in Minnesota today, along with Virginia and South Dakota. With everything that's going on, you just want to make sure everything is secure and that you want to make sure that you're ballot is counted. I'm so stressed about it. I just wanted to get it over and done with so I can kind of get back to feeling normal. Well, of course, the presidential election and campaign is really kicking into high gear now with Election Day just six weeks from Tuesday. I had a talk with NBC's Chuck Todd about what's coming up. With less than 50 days until Election Day, both President Trump and Joe Biden on the campaign trail, and in fact, both are visiting my home state, Minnesota, on Friday. Well, joining me now is Chuck Todd, moderator of NBC's Meet the Press. Good to see you, Chuck. So you have Ch you have uh, Bob Woodard on Meet the Press on Sunday, and his book had some bombshell revelations. So what has been the fallout? Has the president's comments about the coronavirus changed anything for voters, as far as what you can tell? Look, we've actually we actually tried to measure this in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, and you know I don't think any single revelation has been. Uh, has impacted the president, but I, uh, on any of these books that have come out and these revelations. But you know what they have done? They've not helped him. And, uh, and the point is this: he's he may not he may not have lost any new voters, but right now he is stuck in the mid to low 40s, uh, particularly in the northern battlegrounds. He's in a better, slightly better shape in the southern battlegrounds, where he's in the mid to high 40s. Donald Trump's biggest problem right now is he can't win back the same people that voted for him the first time. And I think these accumulation, this accumulation of, of, of bad anecdotes with Woodward, with the Atlantic Magazine article from a week before, all of this, I think it prevents him from essentially getting some of these skeptical Trumpers. You know, you have the never Trumpers, but there's a group of what I call skeptical Trumpers. Um, they want to come home, and yet these stories prevent them from coming home. It's that gray area right there. Will you also have... HHS Secretary Azar on your show on Sunday and a COVID vaccine from what we've been hearing seems to be getting closer. But how legitimate is the concern that the race for that vaccine has become too politicized? Well, the public seems to be concerned. Only 20. We had a, a survey out earlier this week, NBC Survey Monkey, uh, that had only 26 percent trusted what they heard from the president on the vaccine. 52 percent did not trust what they heard from him. I think that the biggest challenge for the government and the vaccine is to get the politicians out from talking about it. The more the president puts a stamp of approval on, the more polarizing and divisive that becomes. The more Anthony Fauci tells you that a vaccine is okay, the more comfortable the public is. So I do think when it comes to the vaccine, um, if it is safe and, and, the, and the scientists feel good about it, the last person marketing it, might you, you might not want it to be any partisan politician, whether it's Trump or Biden, um, because, you know, you almost want to take the politics out of this. And, you know, my concern is that this thing's already been so politicized. That, mm -hmm. And if you only get, say, 50 percent of the country that's comfortable taking this vaccine, well, we're going to be living. Then we're going to have to even if you're vaccinated, you know, people are going to be wearing masks. Um, it doesn't really get us back to normal. So this is going to be quite the challenge. And I, I, I worry that we're already way behind 
on getting sort of uh, people comfortable with a vaccine. And for us, if we if you live in Metro Atlanta for here, you see nothing but those political ads for the presidential race, but also we have two U.S. Senate races that are going on here in Georgia as well. So what have you seen in terms right. of polling numbers that would give Democrats or Republicans more confidence about what happens here in November? Well, I'll tell you this. I, I think a lot of us in the political sort of uh, information world uh, that, that, that do this for a living, I think all of us expected at some point that well, maybe Republicans will start pulling away in Georgia, as they always do come this time of year, and you're not seeing that. And I think the bigger conclusion I've come to is that the Atlanta, the change in the Atlanta suburbs is just like the change we're seeing in the suburbs, whether they're Philadelphia, Indianapolis, Detroit, Phoenix, Denver, Houston, Dallas, the trend line is the same, and I think you're seeing it uh, in a big way in the Atlanta suburbs. And, and so, I, I look, my biggest takeaway is, is you know, I think we have undercovered and uh, underplayed the David Perdue Senate seat. I think a lot of attention has been given to the to the other seat and sort of a, the Kelly Loeffler story. Obviously, her initial story, she had a, a little more of a brand name, and that's a very contentious uh, all-candidate race. But I'll tell you, when I saw David Perdue have to put up the ad about his stocks, having to, had to put up his own, having to advertise saying, hey, I did nothing wrong, but having to confront that issue, um, I, look, I think Democrats are in a lot better shape in Georgia than I ever expected them to be this close to November. All right. Always good insight from you. Meet the Press airs Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on 11 Live. Chuck, thanks so much. It sounds like it's going to be a great show. IBM is putting $100 million in assets toward expanding opportunities for a diverse new generation of researchers, teachers, and scientists. The Quantum Education and Research Initiative will provide resources for 13 historically black colleges and universities, among them Atlanta's Morehouse College and Clark Atlanta University. The program gives students access to IBM's quantum computers plus other innovative technology training and special projects. The goal is to help HBCU students enhance their skills to become leaders in engineering, math, and other STEM fields. Coming up, details on a new proposal that would forgive up to $50,000 in student loan debt for Americans suffering financially because of the pandemic. Well, things around here are really drying out and it's going to be cooling off over the weekend. But meanwhile, the tropics still heating up. Our latest storm beta coming off the Greek alphabet list. So coming up, we'll show you where all the storms are tonight and just how active things could be this week. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Elizabeth Warren have introduced a proposal that would cancel federal student loan debt due to the coronavirus pandemic. They're asking the president to forgive up to $50,000 per borrower. In recent years, student debt has reached new record highs, totally more than $1.5 trillion. As temporary relief, the Department of Education has paused student loan payments until the end of the year. And while students are struggling, so are universities. Many colleges and universities are struggling with severe budget problems. Let's connect the dots between the pandemic and higher education. We all know college can be expensive, forcing parents and students to go into debt just to pay for it. Thanks to coronavirus, more students are deciding to take a year off. Some have health concerns, and many report worrying about paying tuition. But that tuition money is not the only place where colleges make their money. There are actually three sources of funds for higher education, tuition, the federal government, and state governments. When the system was initially put in place, state governments were supposed to shoulder the most cost. This led to widespread affordable higher education options at state schools after World War II. But the trouble started when state governments suffered budget shortfalls. Higher education was a prime target for cuts because schools could always raise tuition to make up the money. So in pretty much every economic downturn since the 80s, states have cut money for colleges and universities, leaving many schools in a precarious position heading into this pandemic. Higher pay and better benefits, big draws for jobs in the tech sector. Yet blacks and Latinos make up a tiny fraction of that workforce. Sharon Epperson reports on a nonprofit that's trying to change that. Working in tech wasn't on Jossie Julian's radar when he was in high school. It was a totally foreign concept to me. Through All Star Code, really, I, I was really able to open my eyes to the, the power that tech has. All Star Code, a nonprofit educational organization, aims to get black and Latino young men interested in tech by teaching them computer science. I just found it like super empowering to be able to take something from concept to a technically executed project. Empowerment is the goal, since the most recent U.S. employment data shows blacks and Latinos make up less than 15 percent of computer and information technology managers. Providing access, providing an exposure, providing skills into the tech sector at the high school age is incredibly important. Danny Rojas is executive director of All Star Code, which went virtual this summer with 152 students. Mentoring innovative entrepreneurs is part of its mission. We not only need to be consumers of technology, but we need to be creators of technology. Having some coding skills is sort of like uh, being dressed for success. One of the few black tech CEOs in the country, Rocket Lawyer's Charlie Moore, says these programs provide an on-ramp for many careers. There's so many careers that are available now for somebody who is, who is a computer scientist. That on-ramp can make you better as a lawyer or as a physician or medical researcher. You name it, you can be better if you've taken some computer science, if you've learned to code. Thanks to this coding academy and its corporate sponsors, at 21, Jossie Julian is a Google software engineer. The big takeaway there is that it's not really something that companies should be like opting into because of like a, a political trend or something like that. A company should really feel a sense of responsibility to bridge the gap. And help to change the face of tech. 
Target says it is also working to increase diversity. The company says it plans to increase its black workforce by 20% in the next three years. The announcement coming in the company's latest diversity report. Target's chief diversity and inclusion officer says leadership development and training programs will also be offered to black team members. In 2019, about 15% of the company's employees were black, but representation dropped to just 5% among officers. Well, we are going to see those winds blowing as we head in through the weekend, and we're seeing those northeasterly winds. So those are coming from a, a cooler spot. So it is going to feel kind of chilly at times. I think early on Sunday morning, particularly when those winds are up around 20, 22 miles per hour, and the temperatures get down in the low to mid 50s. So it's definitely going to feel a lot chillier out there, and fall is going to be in the air. Fall begins on Tuesday. Uh, let's take a look at the satellite. This is what is left of Sally? Not much sheared apart totally and moving out over the Atlantic. And that's because we have a frontal system here that kind of helped funnel Sally off into the sea, lost all those tropical characteristics as well. So Sally's history, and since then we had three named storms today. It was just such an active day. It's really hard to keep up with all the names this year. And now we're into the Greek alphabet too. And the latest of which here is uh, Beta that's in the Western Gulf. So we're gonna have to watch it over the weekend. But our weather story is going to be uh, earmarked by that cool air that is going to be moving in. Cooler, breezy conditions over the weekend. So nothing tropical in nature for us this week. And less towards the end of the week, a little of that moisture from Beta gets pulled in here. And we'll watch for that possibility. But for the most part, we're in for a really nice, I'd say the nicest week of the year. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's going to be the nicest week of the year. 83 was our high today. That is the warmest we're going to be all week long. We're going to be in the 70s each and every day as we head into this week. We're looking at 83 was our high today, 67 our low. We should be around 82 and 64. So we were pretty close to where we should be. And from this point on this week, temperatures are going to be going downward. So the next 12 hours, we're down in the low to mid 60s. Nothing that chilly tomorrow morning because we're going to have a lot of widespread spread cloud cover. That's going to be stubborn to clear as we head into our Saturday as well. So a nine on our wasometer on that scale of one to an 11 with an 11 being a perfect day, just a nine. And we'll have those temperatures starting out in the low 60s and getting into the low 70s. I shouldn't say just a nine. A nine is pretty good. It's going to be mostly dry, but kind of cloudy throughout the day. Temperatures running about 10 degrees below average for this time of year. And that's where we're gonna stay for most of this week too. So here you go as we take a look at overnight conditions. We have the clouds out there, maybe just a few little sprinkles. So we'll be mostly dry. And those pesky sprinkles should be out of here by the afternoon. We see a few peaks of sunshine in the afternoon and things will start to clear out overnight, Saturday night and into Sunday. And those breezy conditions kicking in as we head into Sunday uh, afternoon. So here are our storms. This is Beta that's in the Western Gulf. It's going to impact the coast of Texas and some of that moisture could get pulled in here later in the week. Then we have Teddy. Teddy's a strong storm, a hurricane, a major hurricane heading for Bermuda and then on up into Eastern Canada. So not impacting the East Coast as far as the U.S. East Coast at this point. Wilfred looks pretty pitiful out here as it kind of just moves very slowly to the west-southwest. And then we have Alpha. That was our first Greek alphabet name of, this, of the year, and that was today, earlier today, and it's a, impacting Portugal. It will likely become extra tropical. It's subtropical now. It'll likely become subtropical as we head in through the weekend. And we have a couple other systems we're watching out here. This one in the eastern Atlantic, about a 30 to 40 percent chance of development and an easterly wave coming off of Africa. And that could develop as we head into the next five days. So we've gone through the entire list of names for the year. Now we are through Alpha and Beta and Gamma will be the next name on the list. So. As far as we're concerned, it's going to be nice and dry and cool this week, the nicest week of the year. Fall begins on Tuesday. Temperatures are down upper 40s to near 50 on Tuesday morning. We stay dry for much of that next week, but we'll be watching for some of that moisture from Beta to maybe work its way in here on Friday late in the day. Here's a few other stories you may have missed today. Six Flags Over Georgia is opening again today for Hollow Fest. The park making some adjustments because of the pandemic. So if you're thinking about paying with cash, then you might want to think again. Just bring the plastic. You won't be allowed to use cash anywhere inside the park. 
Only some of my good friends, credit cards, debit card, and mobile pay options will be accepted. That includes Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, Apple Pay, Google Pay, and debit transactions. Six Flags is one of the first theme parks to make this change. Season 13 of The Real Housewives of Atlanta is going to look really different. Nene Leakes announced she is leaving the popular reality show. Nene has been a fixture on the show since it premiered back in 2008. In a video, Nene says, quote, I have been on an extremely, extremely long, exhausting, tiring emotional negotiation. There has been a lot of emotion flying on both sides. It has been hard, and I have made the very hard and difficult decision to not be a part of The Real Housewives of Atlanta season 13. One of the show's producers thanked Nene for her time on the show, calling her an icon of the genre. The man who gave us the line, life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get, has died. American novelist Winston Groom passed away Wednesday night in Alabama. He created the iconic character Forrest Gump, which many of us came to know and love, writing the book, which then went on to become a movie in 1994 starring Tom Hanks. The movie won six Academy Awards. Alabama's governor tweeted, saddened to learn that Alabama has lost one of our most gifted writers. He was 77. We'll be right back. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. She's not quite ready to be out on the road just yet, but up in the sky, that is no issue for a teen in Arlington, Virginia. Jess Orland, with our sister station out in Washington, D.C., sat down with her to talk about her goals for the future. This Arlington high schooler flew an airplane before she drove a car, and that's just the beginning for this aspiring naval aviator. 
That's 17-year-old Nyla Williamson flying the plane. Oh, I had not even taken my driver's classes, so definitely different priorities than other teenagers in life. She got on a flight simulator in sixth grade. And I just absolutely fell in love with it, and then I decided since then that I wanted to pursue flying. Two weeks ago, she passed her written exam to become a pilot. She plans to earn that license before she graduates as she works toward becoming a naval aviator in the Marine Corps, a position held by few women. It's a uh, learning as you go experience, just being willing to make mistakes but then learn from them, not being afraid of failure. As a potential fourth generation service member, Nyla hopes to follow in the footsteps of women like Virginia native Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swagel. She's the Navy's first black female tactical fighter pilot. Seeing someone who looked just like me pursuing the same dreams I had was completely inspirational. Now. She's determined to log those 40 hours. She says she needs to earn her license. Maybe one day I can be a first in some area too. People who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money? 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. First on this Friday night, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died from complications of pancreatic cancer. She was 87. Justice Ginsburg was the second woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court and was a pioneer for women's rights. We are now going to Washington, D.C. to give you a live look outside the Supreme Court where crowds have started to form in remembrance of the Supreme Court justice. It is a large crowd. Just over the last hour, it has really grown. 
Uh, Justice Ginsburg was appointed in 1993 by President Clinton, but in her most recent years became a cultural icon for millennials and Gen Z with her progressive votes on social issues. Jessica Schneider has a look back on Justice Ginsburg's legendary and groundbreaking life and career. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's rise from a humble Brooklyn neighborhood to the nation's highest court was a classic American story. What is the difference between a bookkeeper in New York's garment district and a Supreme Court justice? Just one generation, my mother's life and mine, bear witness. Where else but in America could that happen? She was smart, tied for first in her class at Columbia Law School, but in the late 50s and early 60s, the glass ceiling stood firm. There were three strikes against her. First, she was a woman. Second, she was Jewish. Third, she had a young child. She turned to teaching law and fighting gender discrimination for the ACLU. Very much with the model of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund led by Thurgood Marshall, she had this idea that you have to build precedent step by step. In 1980, Ginsburg became a federal appellate court judge. So help me God. So help me God. 13 years later, she was named to the Supreme Court by President Clinton, the second woman on the bench. The first, Sandra Day O'Connor, was glad to see her. The minute Justice Ginsburg came to the court, we were nine justices. It wasn't seven and then the women. And it was a great relief to me. As a justice, Ginsburg consistently voted in favor of abortion access and civil rights. Perhaps her best known work on the court, writing the 1996 landmark decision to strike down the Virginia Military Institute's ban on admitting women. She was also known for her bold dissents, like the one she wrote when the court stopped the 2000 Florida ballot recount, struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act, and ended the contraception mandate for some businesses under the Affordable Care Act. In our view, the court does not comprehend or is indifferent to the insidious way in which women can be victims of pay discrimination. In 2007, the high court ruled against Lily Ledbetter, a factory supervisor at a tire plant in a high profile pay discrimination case. Ginsburg urged Congress to take up the issue in her dissent. 20 months later, the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was the first bill that President Obama signed into law. After Justice John Paul Stevens retired in 2010, Ginsburg became the most senior of her liberal colleagues. But she didn't slow down. Stephen Colbert discovered that the hard way, trying to keep up with RBG's famously tough workouts. I'm cramping and I'm working out with an 85-year-old woman. Ginsburg hired a trainer after treatment for colorectal cancer in the late 90s. In 2018, doctors treating the justice for broken ribs discovered cancerous growths on her lung. The surgery was successful, but the recovery caused Ginsburg to miss oral arguments at the Supreme Court for the first time in her career. She was also treated several times for pancreatic cancer, but always stayed up on her court work. Even after losing her husband of 56 years to cancer, Ginsburg was back on the bench the next morning. I love the work I do. I think I have the best job in the world for a lawyer. I respect all of my colleagues and genuinely like most of them. <laughs> her best friend on the bench was the late Justice Antonin Scalia, her ideological opposite. And what's not to like? <laughs> Except her views of the law, of course. <laughs> They shared a laugh about Ginsburg drinking wine before nodding off at the State of the Union. I was 100% sober because before we went to the State of the Union, <laughs> we had dinner together, and Justice Kennedy brought in. Well, that's the first intelligent thing you've done. <laughs> in her later years, she gained rock star status with millennials thanks to social media. It was beyond my wildest imagination that I would one day become the notorious RBG. <laughs> the nickname was a play on the name of the late rapper, the notorious B.I.G. There were books, clothing, tattoos, even a species of praying mantis in her honor, along with a recurring SNL sketch. Oh, you just got Ginsburned. <laughs> There was a feature film on the basis of sex and a documentary produced by CNN. 
RBG was an unexpected box office hit and gave the justice an even larger platform to share her lifelong mission of gender equality. People ask me sometimes, when will there be enough women on the court? And my answer is, when there are nine. <laughs> Joining me right now, 11 Alive political analyst, Dr. Andra Gillespie from Emory University, a diminutive woman in size, but a towering figure in the history of the country and the U.S. Supreme Court in her impact, her progressive politics, yet at the same time, this was a, a very, very human person who was uh, warm to the touch. And, and the other thing about her, Dr. Gillespie, is uh, she came up at a time in the 1960s when women were not in law school. You, you just didn't see them. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Justice Ginsburg is a pioneer in women's rights and making sure that uh, the law was used to protect the rights of women and to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, you know, that's how she uh, made her name to fame. That's how she got on the radar of people like Bill Clinton, who um, nominated her to the Supreme Court, and she certainly kept that up as uh, through her rulings. And so if you look at the that she was writing on. She uh, was definitely a champion of women's rights, a champion of civil rights, more broadly speaking. Um, and just given the balance of power in the courts and the fact that she is dying during the administration of a Republican president, it's very likely um, that President Trump will nominate somebody who, from an ideological standpoint, is going to be very different from her and whose judicial philosophy is likely going to be very different from hers. So how does this work? Can Democrats slow this down? Can they block anything that President Trump does. How does that play out? Give me a sense of that. Well, I mean, so what we expect uh, is that President Trump is going to nominate somebody to try to fill the seat very quickly. Uh, we've known in the last couple of weeks that he's already put out a list of names of potential Supreme Court nominees. He was doing that for campaign purposes. He's likely going to draw from that list and make a nomination. He's going to have the support of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who, although he blocked the nomination of Merrick Garland in 2016, when um, Justice Antonin Scalia passed away, um, he's likely to try to make this happen. And I think the big question is going to be whether or not the Republican uh, Senate conference is actually going to go along with that. Um, there could be some uh, Republican senators, particularly ones who are running in close electoral contests, who may feel skittish about doing that and might worry about the backlash of looking hypocritical after blocking the Merrick nomination in 2016. So we have to see whether or not Senator McConnell can actually keep the Republican coalition together in order to push through a nomination. I think that with Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg's death, uh, it, it sort of foregrounds the importance of the court. It was already important. Um, when you listen to President Trump's stump speech, he talks about his judicial nominations as uh, as an area in which you know he kept a promise. Um, and we know that there are many Republican voters who have been motivated to support President Trump, despite everything um, that has happened in the administration, um, in part because they care about what the balance of the federal judiciary looks like. And so this is another reason that President Trump might used to try to appeal to them. I think what's likely to happen on the Democratic side is that the courts are going to come to the forefront in ways that we hadn't seen before. And we know that in previous elections, Republican voters might have been more um, uh, activated by what they thought the court composition is going to be. I would expect that Democratic voters are going to be equally animated by what they think is a fight for the federal judiciary and important rulings um, you know, with respect to civil rights, with respect to abortion and other issues. Dr. Andrew Gillespie from Emory University, as always, we appreciate your insight. Thanks for being with us on a Thank Friday you. night on late notice. We really do appreciate it. Thanks again. President Trump was campaigning in Minnesota tonight only seconds after his rally. He made these <laughs> comments about Justice Ginsburg. She just died? Wow. I didn't know that. I just, uh, you're telling me now for the first time. She led an amazing life. What else can you say? She was an amazing woman. Whether you agreed or not, she was an amazing woman who led an amazing life. I'm actually sad to hear that. I am sad to hear that. Thank you very much. 
The Carter Center tonight releasing this statement from former President Jimmy Carter. Rosalind and I are saddened <coughs> by the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a powerful legal mind and a staunch advocate for gender equality. She has been a beacon of justice during her long and remarkable career. I was proud to have appointed her to the U.S. Court of Appeals in 1980. We join countless Americans in mourning the loss of a truly great woman. We will keep her family in our thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. All right, we now go to the latest top stories here in the metro area. A Roswell Police 911 supervisor was fired last Friday over a Facebook meme she shared that the Roswell Police Chief calls, quote, racially charged. The supervisor says she didn't mean to offend anyone. 11 Elias Chinu Her spoke with a police lieutenant who explains why the post was problematic. Rhonda Moore was fired last Friday from her Roswell Police 911 supervisor job for posting this meme on her personal Facebook page. Back in June, some of her co-workers saw the post. It shows the Confederate flag with the caption, if this symbol represents racism in America, so do these. Below the caption, logos for black and Hispanic organizations. Moore told investigators the post is just simply what she believes. Atlanta Police Lieutenant Ralph Woolfolk has worked to build community relations through his work as an officer and helping with legislation. He says it's important for those in law enforcement to not show a bias when it comes to serving the community. We are to maintain objectivity uh, and neutrality as it pertains to these matters, uh, especially in this in this climate. Uh, where we know that we are trying to mend relationships with uh, the community. Lieutenant Woolfolk believes that applies even to personal social media accounts. When police officers uh, or dispatchers or anybody in our line of work, we make comments such as that, uh, pretty much it puts us in a space that compromises those relationships. He says the goal as a public safety worker is to make all people feel they'll get equal treatment no matter who they are. It's the epicenter and core of our objective. Well, the tropics continue to be incredibly active. This could end up being the most active year on record. We had three storms named today, three of them in the Atlantic Basin. So coming up, the activity we're expecting in the days ahead and when you can expect things to really chill out around here. A group of DeKalb County teachers say they had to wait hours in line to get paid, who the school district says is to blame for the mix-up. channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. 
televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more... New tonight, a group of DeKalb County teachers and staff outraged after waiting in line for several hours in order to get paid. The school district says the Postal Service is to blame. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein-Peters spoke with some of those school employees. Patricia Cunningham. They were calling out the names outside the hallway, inside the hallway. It was very disorganized. So I drove 40 minutes down here today after teaching all day. I have waited in there for three and a half hours almost. It's been a total lack of communication, transparency. More than 200 employees with the DeKalb County School District weren't paid on time this week. The district blames a delay in mail or in some cases the incorrect address. School district officials say checks were mailed out nine days ago. They asked employees who had not been paid as of yesterday to come to the school district headquarters Friday afternoon. Officials say they initially estimated only 40 employees needed a reissued check, but by Friday afternoon, the number increased to 200. Some teachers say they waited in line for almost five hours in unfavorable conditions. We were waiting outside for a good hour. Uh, the heat was getting too much for people. We were instructed to go into inside of medium-sized auditorium where we could not socially distance with no, some not wearing masks. DeKalb Schools told us that the issue only impacted new employees or returning employees who hadn't set up direct deposit. They said as of Friday at 6 p.m., all paychecks had been picked up. Meteorologist Samantha Moore joins us tonight with our weekend weather forecast. Samantha, the pressure's on. Bring something good. <laughs> oh, I'm, I can bring you something really good. I think this <laughs> week is going to be the best week we have had all year long. It's going to be incredible, dry and seasonably cool, feeling like fall. Uh, I know Jeff has been wanting to get all the pumpkin spice stuff, so this is going to be the perfect week to get inspired to start experiencing the fall season. Hey, look at the breezy conditions we're going to be seeing as we head into this weekend. So as we get into tomorrow during the morning hours, we're going to see those winds up around 15 miles per hour and then come Sunday morning, even stronger than that up around 20, 22 miles per hour, maybe even 23 miles per hour. So that's going to make it feel even cooler 
out there. So just keep that in mind. So as we take a look at the pattern, this is what's happened. What is left of Sally isn't much uh, after all that flooding rain that Sally brought in. Now look at the radar. We do have the showers that are working their way off the coastline. And as we go to the wall and take a look at the radar, you can see what is happening here. Take a look at the radar. Is it not up? There we go. Um, you can see that it's moving uh, off the coastline, all that moisture, and that frontal system is down in Florida. And behind that front, we're seeing those northeasterly winds move in, and that's why we're really going to be cooling off this week. And we have this tropical storm now that is in the western Gulf. That's beta. More on that coming up. That's the second letter, of course, in the Greek alphabet. So you can see where the dry air is filtering in behind that front. It is still moist well out into the Gulf and in the Atlantic, of course, as you would expect. But here across North Georgia, a much different picture uh, than we saw this week with all that heavy uh, tropical moisture around. It is going to be nice and light and that dry air filtering in as we head in through the weekend and next week too. 83 was our high today. That is the hottest we are going to be in a long time, at least for the next week. We are going to be down in the low 70s for much of the week. So a big change is headed our way. Now tonight we'll see those temperatures get down in the low to mid 60s. Plenty of cloud cover out there. So we have a nine on the wasometer. We're expecting it to be mostly dry, but we will have widespread clouds and temperatures will be about 10 degrees below average for the date. And then as we head into the afternoon, We'll start to see some peaks of sunshine late in the day, but for the most part, it's going to be a gray Saturday. So widespread overcast for the first half of the weekend. I think it'll be mostly dry. There may be a few spits of drizzle uh, trying to work their way in, especially the first half of the day on Saturday. And then we'll feel a drier conditions of fallish temperatures moving in for the beginning of the week and into next week. Okay, this is beta. You know, we had three name storms today. So beta was a third of those, and it is expected to move in into Texas and impact them as a category one hurricane, and then likely paralleling the coast. After that, there's a lot of uncertainty with this one. So we're gonna have to watch it carefully. It's possible by the end of next week, some of that moisture could get pulled in here. So we'll watch it carefully for you. Hurricane Teddy is a strong one. It is a major hurricane. It's going to impact Bermuda and then work its way to the north, most likely impacting Halifax by the time we get to uh, next week, beginning of next week, right around Tuesday into Wednesday, it'll be impacting Eastern Canada, uh, but it won't impact the US. So that's good news for us. Alpha is over here in Portugal. That was the first of the Greek alphabet to be used today and this season, the first of the season, it's going to live a short life and die out likely as we head into Saturday as it's moving over land, Portugal and then Spain. So, and then we had Wilfred. I don't want to skip over that. That was the last on the standard list. Four storms to talk about today and it's moving to the west. Expected to weaken as well. So, we're still an active pattern out there and we have two more here in the hopper that could be impacting us as we head into the end of next week as well. So we'll be into that Greek alphabet. If they get named, we'll continue through that Greek alphabet for sure. So as we take a look at your forecast, you can see it's going to be cool. It's going to be dry as fall begins, feeling very fallish and pumpkin spice-ish as we head into next week with temperatures staying below average for this time of year. Here's your weather wow moment. It is going to be, oh, look at this mess in Monroe County. All of the rain we had well over a half foot of rain causing some real headaches there with a collapsed road in Monroe County. What a mess this was. Thank goodness we're going to have a dry week ahead for all of this cleanup. We want to uh, thank our storm trackers for contributing to all the storm coverage we had this week. If you'd like to be an 11 Alive Storm Tracker, we'd love to have you. Just go to Facebook, put in 11 Alive Storm Trackers, uh, apply to be a member of the group, and hopefully we'll see your work here right on WATL and on 11 Alive. On the Big 36, you bet. How a local teacher is going above and beyond to inspire and engage her students during virtual learning. <laughs> Times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Virtual, in person, or a hybrid of both, teachers have certainly had a lot on their plates this school year, regardless of how class is in session. But one Coweta County teacher has taken the job one step further to make her students smile. Cheryl Preheim has the story. Welcome to Latasha Washington Williams's new classroom. It's the best day ever. For 17 years, she's been teaching family and consumer science at East Coweta High School. When the district decided to approach hybrid learning this year, she knew she had to get creative. I had to figure out a way to get my, my, my students interested in logging on. She opted for a subtle virtual entrance. <laughs> Every day, she dons a different costume for her kids. They say that it takes 2.7 seconds to catch someone's attention. We have fun here I have 30 kids, four blocks, 120 students. They all log on. And it's that, that 2.7 seconds that I have to get them to log on and be interested. Of course, she's got her favorite looks. The Marshmallow Man. That's my absolute favorite. And then I also love the one when I did the Frozen because I just love that song. Love is an open door. It is. Tasha says it may sound simple or silly, but it is important for her students. They are having to get adjusted to this new normal of not everyone being at school. And if I can just do something for them for, for 90 minutes to make them laugh while they're learning, I feel like I've done my job. It's crazy times, but we're making the best out of it. You know, teachers are always so selfless in the creativity and enthusiasm. I actually feel cheated, Jeff. Why don't you ever walk in here like that? You know, I, I was not going to answer your question. Instead, <laughs> I was going to go another direction. I didn't have any teachers like that. Most of them said, Mr. Hollinger, please sit down and shut up. Okay. All right. Well, I will see you in 30 minutes. Hopefully you are not <laughs> shutting up. Uh, but I'll see you over on 11 Live for up late. Soon. All right. I'll answer more of your questions then. Fair enough. Can't wait. All right. Here's what's coming up on the Big 36. We'll give you an update. Very latest on the legacy of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died tonight at the age of 87. We speak to a former federal prosecutor about the impact that Justice Ginsburg has had on history. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid... This is a live look outside of the U.S. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. Crowds have formed most of the evening in remembrance of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died of cancer tonight at the age of 87, an extraordinary life, an American life that began in the Bronx and took her to the highest place in American government and an impact on American society for generations to come. The longtime Supreme Court Justice again died this evening at her Washington, D.C. home. She was surrounded by her family, had pancreatic cancer. She had cancer five separate times and, and had battled through it repeatedly. An amazing, amazing saga of courage, just trying to stay healthy. Tracy Potts looks at the life and legacy of a woman who inspired and fought for generations of Americans who was affectionately called the notorious RBG. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg spent more than a quarter century on the U.S. Supreme Court and spent much of her career fighting for equality. How wrong it is to judge people on the basis of what they look like. Born in Brooklyn, New York, she tied for first in her class at Columbia Law, but with no job offers from law firms, this was the late 50s, she taught at Rutgers and Columbia then helped launch the ACLU Women's Rights Project in the 70s. Later, as their lawyer, she won five of six cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Her ultimate goal was to get sex discrimination treated by the, sa by the Supreme Court the same way that race discrimination was treated. From the Court of Appeals, President Clinton made her the second female on the nation's highest court, where she continued to even the playing field, ending male-only college admissions, supporting reproductive rights and the LGBTQ community. While her rulings leaned liberal, off the bench, she was close friends with the late conservative justice Antonin Scalia. In her 80s, Ginsburg became popular with a new generation, celebrated in the book The Notorious RBG and parodied on Saturday Night Live. I'm never going to step down now. You can't get rid of me. There's this whole new generation of young people who really admire her and think of her as, you know, kind of a rock star. Justice Ginsburg spoke out about the Me Too movement. It is as effective for the woman who works as a maid in a hotel as it is for Hollywood stars. A wife, a mother, a grandmother, an advocate for equality for nearly half a century. I'm joined by former federal prosecutor and current defense attorney Brett Williams. Brett, good to see you. So what is the legal legacy of Justice Ginsburg? What does she leave behind? Well, first, she's a titan and an amazing jurist was an amazing jurist, and what she leaves behind is a legacy of, of, of being a wonderful Supreme Court justice, an advocate for the rule of law and the rightness of law. I don't know if people know, her nickname among certain people was the notorious RBG oh, yeah. because of her commitment. Yes, absolutely. We that was that did become her affectionate name, nickname. She was also known as a Supreme Court justice who was more liberal. What kind of void will she leave in the court? Well, and people say liberal. Uh, it was a, an approach to the law and to justice. And the void she'll leave is to is being that vote and that voice and that advocate for that particular set of values, that outlook. And that's one of the things 
that we lose on the court by losing her as an associate justice is that voice, that advocate, that perspective in the marketplace of ideas. You know, and as we are approaching an election coming up in November, what are your thoughts on what happens next, especially since her, her, her death is so close to that election? Will they reelect someone new or will they wait until afterwards? What are your thoughts? Well, and those are two options. And one of the things that's going to be, I think, unfortunate is this may become a football. Uh, as many people can remember with the nominee Justice uh, Merrick Garland, under Obama, the previous president, uh, that nomination got held up. The Senate wouldn't hold a vote. And ultimately, uh, Gorsuch was nominated uh, and put on the court by the current president after the election, mm -hmm. much to the consternation of Democrats and possibly delight of Republicans. The question is whether her seat will become that type of political football in this, given it's so close to the election. Well, I suppose only time will tell. She has such a rich legacy that she leaves behind, a staunch fighter for women's rights, an icon for sure, always known as the notorious RBG. Brett Williams, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The presidential campaign now kicking into high gear. Election day, six weeks from Tuesday. A lot to talk about with NBC's Chuck Todd, who spoke with Natisha Lance. And this interview was recorded before the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. With less than 50 days until Election Day, both President Trump and Joe Biden on the campaign trail, and in fact, both are visiting my home state, Minnesota, on Friday. Well, joining me now is Chuck Todd, moderator of NBC's Meet the Press. Good to see you, Chuck. So you have Ch you have uh, Bob Woodard on Meet the Press on Sunday, and his book had some bombshell revelations. So what has been the fallout? Has the president's comments about the coronavirus changed anything for voters, as far as what you can tell? Look, we've actually we actually tried to measure this in our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, and you know I don't think any single revelation has been uh, has impacted the president, but I, uh, on any of these books that have come out and these revelations. But you know what they have done? They've not helped him. And, uh, and the point is this: he's he may not he may not have lost any new voters, but right now he is stuck in the mid to low 40s. Uh, particularly in the northern battlegrounds. He's in a better, slightly better shape in the southern battlegrounds where he's in the mid to high 40s. Donald Trump's biggest problem right now is he can't win back the same people that voted for him the first time. And I think these accumulation, this accumulation of, of, of bad anecdotes with Woodward, with the Atlantic Magazine article from a week before, all of this, I think it prevents him from essentially getting some of these skeptical Trumpers. You know, you have the never Trumpers, but there's a group of what I call skeptical Trumpers. Um, they want to come home, and yet these stories prevent them from coming home. That gray area right there. Well, you also have HHS Secretary Azar on your show on Sunday, and a COVID vaccine, from what we've been hearing, seems to be getting closer. But how legitimate is the concern that the race for that vaccine has become too politicized? Well, the public seems to be concerned. Only 20. We had a, a survey out earlier this week, NBC Survey Monkey, uh, that had only 26 percent trusted what they heard from the president on the vaccine. 52% did not trust what they heard from him. I think the, the biggest challenge for the government and the vaccine is to get the politicians out from talking about it. The more the president puts a stamp of approval on, the more polarizing and divisive that becomes. The more Anthony Fauci tells you that a vaccine is okay, the more comfortable the public is. So I do think when it comes to the vaccine, um, if it is safe and, and, the, and the scientists feel good about it, the last person marketing it, might you, you might not want it to be any partisan politician, whether it's Trump or Biden, um, because, you know, you almost want to take the politics out of this. And, you know, my concern is that this thing's already been so politicized. That, mm -hmm. And if you only get, say, 50 percent of the country that's comfortable taking this vaccine, well, we're going to be living. Then we're going to have to even if you're vaccinated, you know, people are going to be wearing masks. Um, it doesn't really get us back to normal. So this is going to be quite the challenge. And I, I, I worry that we're already way behind on getting sort of uh, people comfortable with a vaccine. And for us, if we if you live in Metro Atlanta for here, you see nothing but those political ads for the presidential race. But also we have two U.S. Senate races that are going on here in Georgia as well. So what have you seen in terms right. of polling numbers that would give Democrats or Republicans more confidence about what happens here in November? Well, I'll tell you this. I, I think a lot of us in the political sort of uh, information world uh, that, that, that do this for a living, I think all of us expected at some point that 
well, maybe Republicans will start pulling away in Georgia, as they always do come this time of year, and you're not seeing that. And I think the bigger conclusion I've come to is that the Atlanta, the change in the Atlanta suburbs is just like the change we're seeing in the suburbs, whether they're Philadelphia, Indianapolis, Detroit, Phoenix, Denver, Houston, Dallas, the trend line is the same. And I think you're seeing it uh, in a big way in the Atlanta suburbs. And, and so, I, I look, my biggest takeaway is, is, you know, I think we have undercovered and uh, underplayed the David Perdue Senate seat. I think a lot of attention has been given to the to the other seat and so sort of a, the Kelly Loeffler story, obviously her initial story, she had a, a little more of a brand name and that's a very contentious uh, all candidate race. But I tell you, when I saw David Perdue have to put up the ad about his stocks, having to, had to put up his own, having to advertise saying, hey, I did nothing wrong, but having to confront that issue. Um, I, look, I think Democrats are in a lot better shape in Georgia than I ever expected them to be this close to November. All right. Always good insight from you. Meet the Press airs Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on 11 Live. Chuck, thanks so much. It sounds like it's going to be a great show. Well, we kind of are going from one extreme to the other. We were warm and wet with Hurricane Sally. Now she's out of here. Frontal systems moved in and it's ushering in some much cooler, drier air for not just the weekend, but into next week as well. And guess what? Fall begins on Tuesday. So coming up, we'll have your fall forecast. Coming up, Fulton County High School football teams join the mix. We have the highlights from the games right here next on the Big 36. Only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. 
We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your... We're going to see some pretty dramatic changes as we head through this weekend and we take a little break from the tropics in terms of what we're going to experience here in North Georgia. The tropics are incredibly active right now, but as far as we're concerned, we're going to see a nice dry break with some cool fall like temperatures. That frontal system actually helped uh, take some of that tropical moisture out of here, push it off to our south and east, and now we're seeing those breezy conditions kick in. So tomorrow morning, we'll have winds gusting up to around 15 miles per hour, and then they'll be even stronger as we head into our Sunday morning, probably up around 20, 22 miles per hour and those temperatures will be in the 50s so it's actually going to feel cool and a little blustery as we head out the door on our Sunday morning. So here's the latest pattern. We have that frontal system. It's down over Florida and behind that we are seeing that uh, dry air being pulled in. We have high pressure to our north sitting over the Great Lakes and the difference between higher pressure to our no north and lower pressure to our south is driving in those northeasterly winds. So that's going to keep us kind of cloudy as we head in into Saturday, we get that kind of wedging up against the southern Appalachians, and that keeps us on the coolish side. So right now we're 62 in Clayton, 61 in Blairsville, 66 in Canton, low 70s in Atlanta. It's a pretty mild night. We're going to see those clouds kind of insulate us in just a little bit overnight. So it won't be as chilly tomorrow. It's going to be Sunday morning when we start to clear it out and we see those temperatures start to drop down in the 50s and we could even have some upper 40s as we head into if not Monday morning then into Tuesday morning which of course is the first day of fall and then as we head in through the afternoon tomorrow we'll see widespread cloud cover and it starts to break up during the evening hours so Sunday will be a better day, I think, than Saturday in terms of the sunshine. So there's going to be a little bit of drizzle trying to work its way into this widespread overcast overnight and into tomorrow morning. Don't think it'll measure up to much, but it could, you know, mess up your car wash if you just had that done today after the rain stopped. And we'll continue to see things look a little gray throughout the day on Saturday. And then things start to clear out during the late evening and into the overnight. And by Sunday, things are, are looking a lot better, but it's going to feel a lot cooler as that wind continues to settle in out of the northeast and we see the cooler temperatures. We could be in the upper 40s in Clayton on Sunday morning, low 50s in Gainesville, 52 degrees possibly, 54 in Duluth, 55 in Carrollton. So it's going to be a cool start to the day on Sunday. So widespread overcast on Saturday, mostly dry though, and then cool fall temperatures as we head into next week. Okay, we have to talk about all of our storms. We are into the Greek alphabet now, beta off the Texas coast. It's going to be headed towards the Texas coast as a category one hurricane. Teddy is a major hurricane. It will affect Bermuda and then push off to the north, affecting eastern Canada. Not expected to impact the east coast of the U.S. Alpha formed today, too. We had three named storms form today. Alpha impacting Portugal and Spain. It will likely weaken overnight into something extra tropical. And then we also have Wilfred out here. And we have two more systems that could be forming as we head into this week. So an active week ahead. We've gone through the list of normal names, and now we are into those. Greek names. So we'll continue to follow those closely as we head into this week. Nice cool weather as we head into the next several days. Nice dry break as well. Fall begins on Tuesday. Temperatures maybe in the upper 40s on Tuesday. That's almost like burr compared to what we're used to and staying dry throughout this week. Well, here we are. We are into the football season, and tonight more school districts join in delaying the start of the season, including Fulton County. So we have included several of their games in honor of their week one. So we get started with our friends from Born to Compete. 
Creekside taking on Westlake, both playing in their season opener. But will there be rust? Westlake quarterback R.J. Johnson with time and completes it to Corey Dixon. Quick game of rock, paper, and scissors. Uh, Johnson's deep ball. Now take a look right on the money, and he is forced out after a big game. The Lions kept on rolling. The high snap. It is Zena Mulba, and he is able to hold on to it, runs all the way to the end zone. Westlake is a winner, 27-7. Noonan led by coach Chip Walker, the former coach for Sandy Creek, where he won three state titles. Noonan handing off to Bryson Moss. Then he passes wide open to Josh Harris. The trick play right out of the gate and into the end zone, 7-0 Noonan. Sandy Creek trying to respond. Here's the high snap. Oh, no! Fumble. Stephen Carter finally come up with it, with it here, and Noonan has a chance to extend their lead. So the very next play, Moss keeps it, and watch him with his stiff arm here. Oh, man, nice little move, and right there, gets it done, chopping the wood. Sandy Creek able to get it on the board, as Deion Arnold also successful, runs away from everybody, a long run. Noonan wins 28 to six their offense doing some good things Rome and Cherokee meeting for the first time Rome with 19 new starters Cherokee with an experienced high powered offense Caleb Ellard with a quarterback keeper for Rome opens up the scoring for the Wolves after a big return watch the catch by a Darius Harshaw and we're going to slow it down right there a great grab Cherokee extending their lead it's now 14 to six the Warriors would keep pounding Keith Adams Jr. here. A rushing touchdown far side. Rome trying to bounce back in the red zone, but it's picked off and fighting for the ball. The Warriors get it back. The defense would continue to stand tall on this night. Cherokee is your winner. Tough battle, tough fight. Good game, 21 to 15. Early look at this week's Team 1-1 Game of the Week. North Forsyth and Hapefield Charter at the Freedom Bowl. Opening quarter, no score. Brady Mites, the quarterback keeper. Mites he get in? Yes, he does. A one-yarder. 8 nothing North after the two-point conversion. Then Bentley Wheeler, the diving interception for North. The defense, a big story in the game. The Raiders take over the Jackets 42-yard line. A couple of plays later, Mites connects with Chris Dixon for a 37-yard touchdown. Might they be successful? Yes, they were. North Forsyth is your winner tonight, 28-14. Braves start their final road series. Max Fried returning from injury. Didn't take too long to get in pretty good form. Five innings, three strikeouts. And the offense got rolling, too. The bats firing at Freddie Freeman. A two-RBI double pulling that one down. The right field line to make it 3 0. Next hitter is Ozuna, and it is gone. That would be one of many home runs for the Braves. They now lead in double digits. They're up 15 to 2. They are in the ninth right now. That's it for sports. We have a lot more coming your way in a few minutes on our brother and sister station, 11 Alive. We'll, we'll take a break. We're back right after this. WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. That's it for us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you over on 11 Alive right about now. Why do more and more families choose our firm after an accident? Because results matter in all injury cases. At Motlick & Associates, we work extremely hard to maximize the value of every case. With billions of dollars recovered and over 35 years of service, our attorneys know what it takes to win. Simply call 1-800-LAW-NEED right now to speak with a Motlick attorney. Or dial pound win from your cell phone. You pay no fee unless you win. This is the kind of card that has America talking. With it, people with Medicare are getting all-in-one coverage for their doctor visits, hospital care, prescription drugs, and more. This kind of insurance, called Medicare Part C, may also cover dental care, eyeglasses, hearing aids, fitness programs, vitamins, even healthy meals and rides to the doctor. With this kind of coverage, you do not need a Medicare Supplement Insurance Plan. You will access your benefits through your Medicare Part C plan for one low and oftentimes $0 monthly plan premium. You deserve to get the most from your Medicare benefits. Call now for free information that may help you get more coverage for less money. There is no obligation to enroll. Whether for yourself or someone you love, call the number on the screen now. Call now. Karen Handel stood with this cardboard cutout and bragged about voting 98% with Donald Trump. I have one of the strongest Trump support ratings. Karen Handel supported Trump's plan to strip away protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Like breast cancer, high blood pressure, coronavirus. I have one of the strongest Trump support ratings. Karen Handel standing with him to take away our health care is nothing to brag about. Every town for gun safety victory funds responsible for the content of this ad. You never know what's around the corner. That's why Ford is built for what's next. Rough terrain, we can help tackle it. A lot going on around you, we can help you focus. Driver in your blind spot, we can help you spot them. And to help you prepare for what's next, your local Ford dealers are offering great deals on America's best-selling brand. Now, get 0% financing for 60 months, plus $1,000 trade assist cash on a 2020 Escape, Edge, or Explorer. Attention Zantac users. If you or a loved one was diagnosed with cancer after regular use of Zantac, you might be entitled to financial compensation. Call 800-474-1495. The FDA has warned that drugs like Zantac, which contain ranitidine, may be contaminated with a cancer-causing agent. If you or a loved one were diagnosed with any of the cancers listed, call us for a free consultation. If you don't win, you pay nothing. 